Hi, everyone, and welcome to this pre-conference webinar uh, co-hosted by FIP 2021 and Planet Bio and uh, uh, sponsored by DSM. The theme of today is sustainability in industrial biotech innovations, life cycle assessment and beyond. And it's an excellent preparation for FIP this year since the third theme is industrial biotechnology delivering the Green Deal. I am very pleased to uh, welcome you for this uh, webinar and uh, uh, in which we will be discussing what are the tools uh, that are there for assessing sustainability and how they are being used in startups, in corporates and in academia. Before getting into the topic, I would like to thank you all for joining. The webinar will be recorded and the slides will be available. We will have a spot for q and I hope that you can see it already, where you can post your questions during the event. And uh, you can also indicate in your questions to which of the panelists you, wa you want to present the question. You can also chat with other delegates present in the event. My name, I'm oh, sorry. My name is Maria Cuellar Soares. I'm a science and technology officer at Planet Bio. Planet Bio is an open innovation hub located at the Biotech Campus Delft in the Netherlands. We offer labs, offices, for the startups and scale-ups that are active in the field of industrial biotechnology. We also offer a network that facilitates research, uh, education, scale-up and commercialization. Should you want more, don't hesitate in getting in touch. Today, we are discussing the, the topic of sustainability and industrial biotech. Industrial biotechnology is often branded as a key technology for achieving the sustainable development goals. And this is not strange because industrial biotech innovations can potentially contribute to mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions, to secure resource supply, and to deliver positive economic impacts. But this is not granted. Negative impacts are possible, and they of course need to be avoided. On the other hand, the acceptance of the technology and stakeholders is not a given. This means that sustainability impacts need to be assessed and quantified so that they can be used for guiding process and product development, to support investment decisions, to guide policy making, and serve as basis in a stakeholder communication. One of the tools that is being actively used for assessing sustainability is LCA life cycle assessment, which is actually a methodology used for assessing environmental impacts throughout the life cycle of a commercial product, a process, or a service. It consists of four steps, starting with a goal and a scope definition, where the system boundaries are very well defined, and very importantly, the objective of the assessment, the goals of the, of the assessment need to be well defined. It follows an inventory analysis where all inputs and outputs are, have, are taken into account both materials and energy, followed by the actual quantification of the impacts. Throughout these phase steps, there comes interpretation, which goes about checking the data, the quality, the consistency, and whether the, the results are still aligned to that original goal and scope. Several impact categories can be quantified by means of LCA. And they can range from a very specific emission, for example, CO2, but they can also be used for combined impacts. For example, if you want to assess whether your processing route has an, any impact on climate change or an area, whether it has an impact on human health, for example. LCA has been normalized to ISO standards and that has uh, um, uh, promoted its incorporation in different organizations. The question is, is this all what it is? Is this all what we need to do? When do you need to use it? Or are there other methodologies or tools that are relevant for biotech innovations? So with this in mind, I'm very pleased to present you to uh, our uh, set of speakers for today, in which we will be looking at the perspectives from a, a startup, Full Foods, from a corporate, DSM, and from academia through TU Delft. So let me start with Christina from Full Foods. 
Christina developed her career during the last 10 years in the energy world, driving large capital projects and decarbonization strategies across Asia, Africa, and Europe. In 2020, Christina co-founded Full Foods, an impact-led biotech startup developing climate-active ingredients, as they call them, and consumer goods centered around microalgae biorefinery. Christina will tell us about their journey, incorporating sustainability in their, in their company. Go ahead, Christina. Thank you, Maria, for the, for the warm introduction. And um, yeah, as, as Maria mentioned, uh, I am Christina Pratt. I am a co-founder at Full Foods. And um, I am waiting for the slides. Uh, I think you can move it already or not? Ah, yes, perfect, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so, yes, we started Full Foods in 2020 to create food and beverage products that net benefit the planet and people's health through the way they are produced, freeing up arable land, using limited resources like fresh water, and efficiently recycling CO2 to produce nutrients. And um, we have two main focus areas. One is the climate and the other one is health and nutrition. And our source to achieve all that is microalgae. Microalgae have been around for years. They currently produce half the oxygen we breathe on Earth, and they are more efficient at capturing CO2 than trees. However, they haven't been very recognized in the food sector. At the beginning, when we started this journey, we couldn't believe how a substance that has the potential to be so sustainable and that is so nutritious, having over 60% of protein and a lot of key vitamins and minerals, how was possible that this substance was not a staple in our diets? So we had to solve this issue. And the challenge was twofold. On one hand, the technical part, solving for the product properties, the organoleptics, the flavor, the solubility, the digestibility, bioassimilation, but also trying to solve for the product positioning, there was a lack of market awareness around this substance. A lot of effort was being uh, put into um, resourcing new ways of cultivation that uh, increase the yield. Many PhDs and academia were focusing into that, but not enough companies were focusing in the downstream processing, in marketing products containing microalgae, in making them appealing to the final consumer. And that's why Full Foods has these two branches. On one side, we are offering um, science-based solutions using innovation and technology. And on the other hand, we are building a mission-driven brand around microalgae and, our, and around food and ingredients that make you feel good, but also have a net positive impact in the environment. And what we do basically can be divided into three main buckets. First of all, we cultivate the microalgae through partnerships using a sustainable cultivation protocol. And during the cultivation, we use CO2 from biogenic sources from the AC, from director capture. In this way, we ensure we have a clean and high quality product. And then it comes the biorefining in which we uh, fraction the microalgae biomass and divide it into different components following the same approach that the oil and gas industry has followed for centuries. And then with one of the fractions, that is the first one that we are commercializing and valorizing, we are uh, producing a beverage, uh, a superfood drink. But we are working in many other products with uh, the other fractions uh, that will see the light very soon. And full the drink uh, called full revive, it's just the first step. It was the product that allowed us to have a quickest go to market and to reach as many consumers as possible in order to have the biggest impact possible. But we are working in many of the things, uh, including the snacks, plant based burgers and uh, nutraceuticals. So keep, uh, keep uh, engaged with full foods and you'll see what will come next. 
Um, in any case, uh, it doesn't matter how sustainable or healthy a product is. When it comes to the final consumer, consumers have to be wanting to buy the product, even if it weren't healthy or sustainable. This means that we had to design something that followed the holy trinity around taste, convenience, and price. Doesn't matter any, anything else. If you don't have these things, these three things in balance, uh, there will not be a, a consumer that will be willing to maybe buy it once, but not to keep on buying it more times. So, of course, our product is very healthy. It has all the uh, right nutrition coming uh, from microalgae. But most of the effort was around how do we communicate this health and sustainability part to the consumers? How we target them? Uh, how do we find our target consumer that is this is conscious consumer, millennial, that uh, is health, is healthy, but also uh, wants to enjoy and wants to make a statement with their daily choices, showing the world that they care. And this brings us to the impact part. How are we uh, quantifying our impact? So we define ourselves, as uh, Maria said before, as climate active. Our proprietary microalgae cultivation captures two to three times its weight in carbon dioxide. And we are working across the supply chain to make sure that we maintain a negative carbon balance. So we uh, capture certain amount of carbon dioxide during our cultivation, and then we make sure that the rest of the operations do not surpass this, va this uh, value. At the moment, we are validating our LCA, uh, so I cannot disclose any numbers, but uh, so far the results uh, show that we are keeping this negative balance. And um, it's very important for us that we are focusing in these three main indicators that are water, CO2 emissions, and arable land. I already mentioned about the CO2 emissions, but uh, we don't require any fresh water in our process, uh, other than for manufacturing the final drink, that is, of course, includes some, uh, some water. But the cultivation per se doesn't require any fresh water. Neither does require any arable land. So we could grow our microalgae on top of buildings, in walls, uh, leaving enough uh, land available for uh, any other uses that might help uh, the might help the environment. And of course, it's not only about uh, the the LCA itself, but about the goals that we have about the CO2 that we set up ourselves uh, to save by 2035 or even 2050. Not only the CO2, but also arable land and also certain uh, impact indicators around health, including protein and reducing consumer uh, sugar consumption. So this is very, it was very important for us from the beginning to set up clear KPIs in goals around the impact metrics that we wanted to fulfill. And also, how do we communicate this to the final consumer, right? Like, probably there is a part of the population that might be interested in the values, in the raw data, in the actual numbers. And we have all this information available in our website because we are 100% for transparency. But there is another part of the population that just want to understand the story. And that's why it's very important to have a to, to, to have the proper storytelling and to explain what is microalgae and how it refreshes our world through an easy language and uh, kind of a funny, uh, funny way of explaining it. And um, I would like also to share, since this is the part of the of the webinar that might be uh, most interesting for uh, for some people here, how are our LCA journey started and where we are now. Um, so when, when we started this journey, um, we need that we had to do, we, we knew that we had to do an LCA, right? But we were very confused by all the frameworks, terminologies. I mean, CO2 removal, offsets, carbon negative, uh, rose to zero, ISO 40044. I mean, it was simply too much. We didn't know where to start. Um, and um, that's why I would like to share some of the questions that we asked ourselves, and some of them 
um, we've been thinking uh, through for the last few months and we don't have clear answers yet, but I think it's very important for any company that is starting the process of, uh, of doing an LCA to first, before anything, and answer these questions or try to answer these questions because it will help a lot in order to identify the right partners uh, to perform the LCA, but also to make it uh, make them accountable for it and also to communicate it in the right way. So these questions uh, are very easy, simple questions, uh, but not for that less important. So first of all is what's your goal as a company and why do you want to perform an LCA? Is just to have a number? Is it because um, you want to show numbers to the rest of uh, your stakeholders? Uh, or is it because you already have a goal and you just want to confirm that uh, you are up to it? Uh, then, what type of LCA do you want to perform? Is it a single product LCA, several products LCA? Is it a company broad LCA? Um, then, are you interested in achieving a certification afterwards? Or is just the number that you are after? Uh, you want to be carbon neutral, you want to be carbon negative, you want to be uh, reducing carbon and have the label in your products. That's very important also because there are certain partners that can help you on that sense, but not on others. And then uh, is the tool, right? Like there are many partners that will help you perform the LCA and they provide you the LCA in a PowerPoint that you cannot action anymore. So every time that you want to review it, you have to go back to them. You are not autonomous on that sense and you cannot use it as a company tool to improve and to track your progress. So if you are interested in having this tool, then you might want to go for a software based LCA or maybe learn or literate yourself uh, in some of the software uh, that are out there, out there, open source or not open source. And uh, last but not least is once you know the results, are you thinking in offsetting or removing or it's enough for you just to have uh, the values. And um, then the last thing that I wanted to share is uh, related with this last question is the carbon offsetting versus carbon removal. Um, I'm not sure how familiar the audience is with the, this different terminology, but I, uh, through my journey, I, I realized that not many people know the difference, right? So with offsets, when one metric uh, ton of CO2 is emitted, one metric ton of CO2 is avoided elsewhere. elsewhere which can still lead to a positive increase in emissions overall globally. Uh, but through carbon removal, when one metric ton of CO2 is emitted, one metric ton of CO2 is removed completely from the atmosphere. And this is important because it's not that we at Full Foods are against carbon offsetting. We believe that can be a short term solution while companies try to reduce their carbon emission further, but it cannot be a long term solution. Many companies rely on fictional levels of carbon offsetting instead of cutting emission, and that's the real problem, right? Because paying someone else to reduce emissions is a zero sum game at, at best. In the short run, it can help pump cash into projects that are very interesting and that can reduce the emissions uh, in, other, in other places, assuming, of course, that these offsets are genuine. But because the entire world at the end needs to bring emissions to zero, not just a few wealthy companies, we can simply pay someone else to do it forever. And at the end of the day, I mean, at the end of the day, there is no one else to pay. There is, there is no one left to pay. So that's why at Full Foods, we, we, do, uh, we, don't, we do not do carbon offsetting. We, re, we believe in working hard to minimize our emissions across the supply chain, uh, regardless of investing in any other uh, technology that reduces it elsewhere. And we, of course, invest in DAC, as I mentioned, to grow our microalgae and in using the clean sources of CO2, um, but that's about it. Uh, we are currently in our process of getting our LCA validated, working with a company in Switzerland and also with CE Delft, uh, that was uh, at the beginning uh, supposed to be here in the webinar also. Uh, and initial results uh, are promising, but uh, we have a long journey ahead and uh, I'll be happy to share more with whoever is interested. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, Christina, for, uh, for uh, sharing with us your journey. 
And I think uh, many people will recognize a lot in the questions that you uh, post uh, towards the end, uh, very recognizable. Um, I would like to uh, move on with our uh, next uh, speaker. Oh. oh, wait, I see that we have quite some uh, slides in between. Yeah, sorry. I, I, uh, <laughs> Not a problem. Time, so so uh, <laughs> here with I would like to uh, invite uh, Ula Latinoa uh, to the floor. Uh, Ula has a background in organic chemistry and uh, since 2005, is leading a laboratory in process research at DSM Nutritional Products with a focus on sustainable chem chemistry and life cycle assessments of chemical and fermentative process. Ula, the floor is yours. Okay, um, I, can you hear me? Okay, I still cannot see the slides. I, it's still carbon offsetting and carbon removal. Can you see it now? Uh, no. Last Martina, Friday. maybe you can help. It worked. Should I do something? Ah, now I see something moving. Yeah. Now it says life cycle assessment for decision making in corporate LCA at DSM. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I try to switch the slide. Which. Okay, it really works. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, I try to be brief on the introductory slides in order to keep the 10 minutes. Uh, in this presentation, I would like to tell you um, what we use life cycle assessment for. And um, I would like to give you one uh, very nice example where we also, where LCA also supported our decision to go forward with the product. So <clears throat> we apply in DSM LCA um, in, in, in many different stages and decisions. We use state-of-the-art knowledge um, and expertise in environmental and social life cycle assessments. And with that, we try to identify sustainability benefits and to translate these environmental benefits into value propositions. Um, oh. <clears throat> there is different phases in LCA or you can use, you can set your boundaries in different uh, ways for the LCA. You have, for example, a cradle to cradle life cycle assessment, which is the green arrow. Uh, in such cradle to cradle LCAs, you look at, you consider all emissions, all waste streams, all input flows, energy and raw materials from extracting the raw materials and getting the energy to the very end and into the next cycle where you recycle the products. This is, for example, true for um, recycling plastics or something like that. There you could uh, use a cradle to cradle LCA. Other um, system boundaries um, is re uh, represented by the orange arrow, which is a cradle to grave life cycle assessment. These are life cycle assessment where in the end the product is disposed. And then you would consider also all energies, all um, waste and emissions and flows from the very beginning um, of making the product until the disposal and consider also the emissions that occur after disposal. A cradle to gate LCA is um, also starting at uh, getting the raw materials and the energy really from, 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 from the soil out of the earth um, until the customer's gate. Such cradle to gate LCAs are used mainly for products that have very different uses. So this is um, very true for, for um, one of our main products, the vitamins, because you can put vitamins into uh, animal feed, you can put it to human nutrition, you can put it to pharmaceutical products, you can also put it to cosmetics. So um, in, in many cases you will see when you deal with uh, DSM's products and uh, talk on LCAs from DSM nutritional products that it's mainly cradle to gate LCAs. So if you look really into making an LCA as um, 
was shown already before, um, the energy and raw materials are considered when calculating environmental impact for all uh, the phases, the life cycle stages of a product, starting with the manufacturing part, uh, via the use part, up to the disposal part. And here you see then this um, cradle to grave LCA. Um, we have in DSM so-called brighter living solutions. These brighter living solutions um, are innovations and products that are better for the planet or for the people. When they are better for the planet, these solutions are called Eco Plus. And we do this in order to tell also to, to analyze our product and to have an idea if our product um, is better performing from an environmental perspective than um, the mainstream reference solution, which would be a similar product available on the world market. And you can see here in the green uh, circle uh, that it's again such a life cycle um, represented and um, that's the information that is used then. And the Eco Plus solutions are then the solutions which have a definitely a better environmental impact, so a lower environmental impact than the mainstream reference solution. And the same is true for the People Plus solution on the social base. Um, LCA is not only used for uh, brighter living solutions, but also for innovation steering, for example. We look at an early phase if the selection of the raw materials are um, uh, really environmentally more friendly. We get an overview of the sustainability profile and we can support um, phase transfer decisions using LCA in innovation. Um, but of course, we also look at imp operational impact improvement. We look at our current processes, do an LCA of the full process of, um, of one product, uh, for example, and that helps us to identify environmental hotspots and we try to solve them. I would like to show you with one example on um, how LCA helped us uh, moving forward with the product and how to come with the product really to, to a market um, uh, to, to launch uh, to, to the market. So uh, where we use really LCA in innovation steering and in operational impact improvement. The example I would like to share with you is on Bovair. Bovair um, is a feed additive that reduces methane in ruminants. Ruminants are uh, essentially cows, but also sheep and goat and also giraffes are, are ruminants. And these ruminants emit methane, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. So how does it work? The ruminants take up feed. Approximately a cow takes up approximately 20 kilograms per day of feed. The feed enters in the stomach here in orange. And the feed is broken down into, uh, if you read from the bottom, into butyrate, propionate, acetate. And these three volatile fatty acids are the energy which is used for milk production and performance of, of the animals. They also release, uh, when the feed is broken down, also carbon dioxide is released and hydrogen and also methane. This methane is um, formed by approximately 10% uh, uh, compared to the other carbon atoms and is then directly emitted by the mouth of the cow and then um, leading really to emissions of greenhouse gases. And we were looking in early innovation into, um, into the topic, is it possible to reduce these methane emissions from, from ruminants by attributing um, a feed additive? So the cows make methane, it's not their fault, it's just a byproduct by digestion. And the methane, as I said just before, is a very potent greenhouse gas, much more potent than carbon dioxide. Um, and the people from um, the chemistry labs found a feed additive that is uh, called Bovair. The active product is 3-nitrooxypropanol. Um, and they could show that it definitely reduces the methane in, in the cow's stomach if they receive a quarter of a teaspoon daily. Um, they reduce, they have approximately 30% less methane. The effect is immediate. And it's also safe for the consumers and for the cows. But we were wondering, is that also really a good idea for the environment? And we needed to check that because 
giving the feed additive, the molecule is shown below on the slide, is only better for the environment if the environmental footprint here, EFP of a cow that has normal feed, is larger than the environmental footprint, EFP C red, um, of cows that have reduced methane um, emissions plus the environmental footprint of the bovair of making the bovair molecule. Um, and in the end, in the beginning, we, we, we thought it might be dangerous because if you can see here below, there's a nitrate group. So um, also nitrous oxides can have a very high uh, carbon footprint, be very potent greenhouse gases. Uh, so we needed really an LCA to show that uh, giving this feed additive is better for the environment. Here you can see the system boundary that was used in the LCA, where we have um, looked at the carbon footprint of one liter of milk of a cow that receives um, this a quarter of a teaspoon of, of the feed additive compared to one liter of milk from a cow that does not receive this feed additive. So here you have in, in the inner system boundary, you have all emissions occurring on the farm. Uh, on the left, you have the uh, emissions occurring um, during crop cultivation. Um, and you have also the transport. And the milk goes out as product as well as animals and also the manure. Fortunately, we could see in a very early stage of the project that indeed from an environmental perspective, it is really a great benefit of, um, um, of reducing the methane by this product. This very small blue bar shows the environmental footprint of one kilogram of the active. So it's 61 kilogram CO2 equivalent per kilogram of three nitrooxypropanol of Bovair. And this very large negative green bar is the carbon footprint that is avoided by attributing these 60 kilograms to the animals. So you have really a, a significant net reduction. You have a footprint of 61 kilograms CO2 equivalent of one kilogram of three NOP, but it prevents the emission of uh, more than 2000 kilograms of CO2 equivalent into the atmosphere. On the right hand side, you can see also the calculation for the milk. And what is most interesting is the last graphic here, where the blue bar, uh, the very last blue bar on the right hand side, shows uh, one liter of milk for, of cows that do not receive bovair. And the other bars are then uh, for one liter of milk uh, with cows that have bovair in their feed. So in the um, University of California Davis, they were assessing the emission reduction of feed of the feed impact um, from from bovair, and they found that 38% of enteric methane could be reduced by the cows if all the cows used bovair, and then that 2.3 billion kilos of CO2 equivalents would be saved. In total, on the right hand side, the lower box, it's um, almost 0.5% of the total greenhouse gas emissions that would be reduced by uh, administering bovair to the cows. Before I said that um, I will not only talk about innovation steering by LCA, but also operational, um, operational improvement. I do not have a slide. This is due to confidentiality reasons, but we were able also by looking at the LCA of making the bovair uh, molecule, the three NOP, uh, that we have, we had two main hotspots in, in making this molecule. And then by applying um, a process research, we were able to lower the footprint of making bovair by 50%. So now we are really at a very, very low carbon footprint of making the bovair. So uh, if you remember the slide before, this blue bar would even uh, be lower by almost 50%. With that, I would like to end my talk. I thank you for your attention and are happy to receive any questions later. Or... Thank you very much, uh, Ulla, to uh, let us see how, uh, how uh, LCA is actively incorporated in a corporate environment and with uh, this uh, very interesting example with uh, Bofer. Um, with this, I would like to introduce you to uh, uh, John Posada. Uh, John is Assistant Professor in the Department of Biotechnology at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. He has a PhD in bio.
design and assessment, and his research interests cover, amongst others, techno-economic, environmental, and social, and integral, integrated sustainability assessment for the bio-based economy, with a special focus on the integration of the three pillars of sustainability for biorefineries. John, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mario. Um, can I have access to uh, sharing the slides? Okay, good, thank you. And I think you can now see uh, the slides, right? Um, I will assume that is a yes. Okay, so, you know, I will try to be um, brief as well, just to keep the 10 minutes. And um, something that I have heard so far in the previous talks is um, LCA is really a tool uh, that assists uh, technical design, right? So that is the way that we can use uh, this type of tools. And uh, from my perspective, and actually what I do is I try to unify the three pillars of sustainability. So that is the techno-economic analysis, environmental analysis, and also social anal analysis for integral sustainability to guide information and to support decision-making uh, in industrial uh, production, including uh, also biotechnology. So <clears throat> to start, I would like to give you first the take-home messages because uh, the time is limited. Um, and uh, the first message, and, and probably you will find this uh, different, uh, you know, messages at the end, a little bit um, simplistic or uh, at least expected. But let me let me walk you through these uh, these ideas. So any innovation, um, and in this case for biotechnology, will lead to different impacts, and uh, these innovations lead to impacts in the three dimensions of sustainability, in economics, environmental, and uh, in society. But something that we have to understand is that the level of these impacts will really depend on the context for which we have uh, a specific, you know, geographical context, technological, environmental, and uh, socioeconomic context, and uh, also different scales. So the larger the production that we may have for one specific product or um, value chain, the larger the impacts in these uh, three dimensions uh, could be. But um, what we aim to do is to understand the uh, consequences on the three dimensions. So also going beyond uh, environmental impact analysis. Um, and for that, we actually have quite some um, yeah, different tools that we can use uh, to be systematic. So that is the first thing to be systematic and consistent. So um, the tools that we use, they should be scientifically uh, relevant. And uh, I think, and that's, that's part also of my opinion, and that's also how I have also built my academic career, is that uh, these different tools and uh, design approaches, they should be inclusive. So accounting for the opinion, for the concerns, for the values of the different stakeholders that may participate at the end in these uh, different value chains. So this is not a trivial task. And uh, this is my, the, the last uh, take home message that I, that I have for today. Um, these different tools, these different ways of doing analysis in an integral way, in a consistent way, that is something that is very uh, challenging, but challenges also mean uh, opportunities. So in that sense, there are great opportunities to develop coherent uh, strategies to fully and by fully, I mean, understand the full uh, or the entire supply chain, going from the collection of raw materials to the final uh, end use of the, of the uh, products that we may have and uh, also the integral perspective, so covering the three dimensions of sustainability, techno-economic, environmental, and uh, social aspects. And let me uh, elaborate a bit on, uh, on these ideas. So there are different opportunities to do innovation along the value chains, and also, um, or in particular in this case, for uh, industrial biotechnology. We can have innovations at the uh, production of the raw materials, uh, biomass, or uh, any type of uh, um, carbon, um, element that we may have um, to produce or to use in, in, in our systems. Anything related to the logistics, you know, collection of uh, our raw materials and uh, distribution of the raw materials, conversion of the uh, biomass into different levels of conversions and uh, also doing the upgrading of these uh, products at, uh, at different levels. And then also the final uh, use, so the application and the end of life of the, of the different products. So, 
yeah, there are different ways or different uh, stages in which we can have uh, innovations. And uh, these innovations also go, uh, we can also zoom in those innovations in terms of uh, process design or equipment design, and even going uh, to the level of the uh, microorganisms uh, in those cases. But something that we need to keep in mind is that uh, any innovation along the value chain or within the process will have um, impacts on the three dimensions of sustainability. So we have already heard about uh, LCA for uh, environmental impact analysis, but there are also other uh, tools for uh, techno-economic analysis, so for process design and for social impact analysis, so everything related to uh, uh, social impacts, either at the large scale or at the small scale for um, a specific uh, regions, regions and, and contexts. Uh, so the first thing is uh, this is really uh, something related to the to the different scales, and then uh, we can have uh, innovations at the fundamental level, at the engineering practice, and also based on uh, social sciences. So for this uh, different um, type of uh, impacts, we will have uh, effects on the economy, on the environmental, uh, on the environment, and uh, on society, as I said before. And in order to do that, uh, and depending also on the context. Um, what we do in, in my group is we combine three uh, complementary uh, research directions. So the first one is everything related to the technical design. So this is um, anything that has to do with uh, process design, modeling, simulation, and uh, economic analysis, not only for the process, but also for the entire supply chain. Um, also everything related to sustainability design, so um, analysis of uh, different impacts uh, in particular, or in this case, for um, for uh, environmental uh, categories or for environmental impacts, but also for uh, social impacts. And something that you see here in the in the slide is that uh, I have different colors because techno-economic analysis, uh, techno-economic evaluation, and life cycle analysis, those are uh, tools that are very well known, very well defined, and even uh, standardized, like in the case of uh, LCA. But for social impact analysis, there's still um, a long way to, to go ahead and uh, also because there are different uh, methods being developed and uh, because they also aim to cover impacts at different scales. So in some cases we focus on macroeconomic analysis, in other cases we focus more on, um, on microeconomic analysis, depending more on the company or on the corporate uh, that we uh, are analyzing at that point. And finally, uh, the, the, the third uh, research direction is related to um, socio-technical systems where we have or we where we apply participatory methods to include or to invite the different stakeholders to take part in the decision making for the uh, development of the supply chain or at least for the uh, development of the specific technology that we are um, developing in in that case so um, yeah that is that is actually the next um, level of analysis so um just for you, uh, one example in which uh, I've been working for quite some time and uh, doing a lot of supervision um, is on, on uh, sustainable aviation biofuel production. In those cases, we have combined all of these uh, different alternatives. And, and the point is uh, for uh, production of aviation biofuel, there are many different raw materials, feedstocks uh, related to agricultural residues, for example or uh, to forestry residues and then for these different types of uh, of raw materials there are also different technologies that can, can be used so uh, chemical processes biochemical processes thermochemical processes and uh, if you look at the number of possibilities only for one region because um, the analysis that i've done is mainly for um, for uh, brazil as case study and even uh, limiting that uh, particular case um, or that particular region we managed to analyze over 300 uh, combinations of um, raw materials, technologies, and processing conditions. So, um, yeah, this is this is something that is you know is, is one important part for the uh, decision making for the design, uh, where we combine the technical aspects uh, along with the environmental impact analysis. But then the next level, and uh, that is uh, also what I'm working. Um, at this point is the implementation and the integration of social impact analysis. In this case, uh, we have been working a lot on uh, macroeconomic models, uh, input output analysis to determine, for example, uh, generation of GDP, um, new employment due to the new uh, value chains that are created. Um, uh, we have also analyzed uh, human health. We have analyzed uh, imports and exports 
uh, for specific regions. So this is really about understanding how the implementation of those novel technologies will affect uh, the specific region where we are. So um, by having this uh, sequential, but also integrated type of analysis, we are able to understand um, the implications of um, of these um, novel technologies and, and innovations. But uh, that is not, you know, by by doing social analysis, we don't stop only in doing the quantitative analysis, the more uh, macroeconomic type type of analysis. In this case, we are also inviting um, stakeholders to take part in the discussion and decision making for the new uh, value chains that we are creating. So we have people uh, related to um, to the production of biomass, uh, people from the government uh, making decisions on uh, infrastructure or even in policies, um, environmental authorities. Um, we had also chemical companies which were interested in the production of um, aviation biofuel. And then in those cases, we also needed to talk to, uh, for example, airports and airlines. So we really had a really uh, a strong uh, participation of the different stakeholders. And then with, with them, uh, we uh, managed to discuss the different technical designs. So the technologies, the supply chains, everything related to the process, uh, the economics of those specific value chains, and then also the environmental impacts, not only for the process, but also for the entire uh, supply chain. In this case, uh, I show just uh, one figure for, um, for the region of Sao Paulo, where we analyzed um, also different, um, different biorefinery systems. So all of these uh, quantitative results on technical, economic, environmental, and social aspects were discussed uh, with, uh, with the stakeholders. So based on these uh, participatory methods, we first managed to implement their uh, concerns and uh, their preferences in the technical design. So we really uh, managed to interpret their um, concerns and their opinions uh, and translate those into technical uh, or uh, yeah, technical specifications. And then um, from that, we uh, at the end managed to have systems that were more um, acceptable. So based on all of this uh, approach and based on this uh, integrative uh, vision, um, we managed to come to a ranking of uh, supply chains for the production of aviation biofuel uh, with base integral sustainability performance. And uh, all of that was based on economic, environmental and social aspects, um, considering technological aspects, but also non-technological aspects um, for the entire supply chain. So my message here is, um, again, you know, uh, any innovation will have effects on economy, environment and society. It is always context uh, dependent and um, we need methodologies that are uh, scientifically and socially relevant. But the most important point is uh, this is something that is still ongoing and uh, the vision that I want you to, to take and, and the final message that I want you to take from this uh, from this talk today is uh, those are always tools that we can improve and that we can uh, apply in a more uh, systematic and uh, comprehensive way for decision making and that's uh, at the end what uh, what we uh, aim to do and uh, what uh, what uh, I'm working uh, what I'm working on so if you have any questions uh, yeah I would be happy to reply to those um, yeah during the panel discussion thank you Thank you very much, uh, John, for bringing the beyond to the title uh, of this uh, of this webinar. Um, I would like to remind the participants that uh, you can post uh, your uh, questions on the chat or in the Q and A uh, uh, box. Um, in the meanwhile, I would like to take it actually from here, from this uh, uh, beyond part. Um, because this part of the stakeholder engagement, I think, affects uh, pretty much all the cases that we have discussed uh, this uh, this afternoon. So, and I think it's if you compare with LCA, uh, then 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 you see the big difference. LCA being something already so standardized that it really you have several tools there that uh, uh, give you a number. They basically give you a number that you can use in a very objective way to uh, uh, to guide your decision making. Societal. Uh, consumer acceptance, stakeholder concerns seem uh, um, quite difficult to, uh, to quantify, at least to my, uh, to my eyes. So uh, I would like to hear your views on uh, um, how this uh, stakeholder involvement um, and these methodologies um, 
and can we make it in this um, as quantified and as science-based as uh, as LCAs uh, until now? So, uh, um, and maybe if you have an example, I mean, uh, I think Christina mentioned about the part of consumer acceptance being so important uh, uh, in, in your product. Uh, but I can imagine also, uh, Ula, that in your case, uh, um, user involvement uh, has been also an important one. So, um, uh, whoever feels that uh, want to, uh, to uh, discuss this further, please go ahead. <laughs> Shall I start? But probably my, my answer is a bit uh, obvious. Um, I'm very much in favor of uh, including stakeholders uh, as part of the design and something that i have learned you know along this journey taking already something like five years since uh, i've been trying to do this um is is that uh, we as uh, technical designers as process designers always overlook and uh, underestimate you know many different problems that we may encounter in the actual application of uh, of uh, novel technologies and novel processes so by talking to people who have been dealing with uh, biomass and uh, with people making the uh, policies at the end or uh, people with uh, dealing with the commercial part and the daily you know the daily day day by day uh, problems we actually learned a lot and uh, from those discussions and from their concerns we actually managed to have uh, designs that uh, are now preventive, otherwise those designs would have been uh, corrective. So that's something that I've really learned from this type of uh, approaches. And that's talking only from the technical perspective. Then we say, okay, in addition to that, let's uh, take into account environmental and social aspects. Uh, the designs that I would prefer as a technical person are probably not the same uh, designs as uh, as the ones that come at the end after doing multi-criteria decision-making or um, multi-stakeholders uh, decision-making analysis. So yeah, this, uh, this is something that uh, can really uh, enrich the, the discussion. And uh, yeah, in, in my case, you know, as an academic, always being curious about different possibilities. Uh, this, is, this is a discussion that just uh, grows and grows, but uh, that brings a lot of uh, knowledge. For the effort, because <laughs> yeah, it indeed. does sound like being very much intensive and huh? you have to create a lot of different settings depending who your stakeholders is. So it's a lot more intensive uh, uh, than uh, uh, running a CIMA Pro <laughs> simulation. Let's put it like that. Yeah, it's, it's going, um, going out of the office. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Ula, do you have uh, any experience on, the, on this part? Yeah, I mean, um, engaging stakeholders is, of course, very important. What we have at DSM is really um, we get a lot of questions of customers from customers um i can say too many questions to handle really immediately so we feel the pull from from the market from the customers that need information on uh, on on sustainability aspects from our products and what we also observe in in several cases is that customers um have a certain way to 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 define sustainability to to um label their end products where we have um our, our products in and to label their, their products uh, from a sustainability perspective and then they have criteria they ask us so we have to fill in questionnaires um how did you make it and how do you rate according to our guideline and then what we see is that we really need to get into um, a discussion. So usually uh, we try to, to, to develop uh, labeling for the end products by our customers really in discussions. Because we are using CIMA Pro and LCA, but not all of the customers are using it. And the end consumer has also a word to say and saying, yeah, but I don't understand these carbon footprints and what I want is something which feels good and which is good for the environment. So we really had the um, experience that, of course, the, val the, the results from CIMA Pro help, the carbon footprints, the eco footprints help for the discussions, but it's, it's not the end, it's quite far from the end. So you need an intensive discussion involving the end consumer, involving the, um, the other um, companies along the value chain of the full product. So, um, but 
this is really a, um, also a good perspective going to the future uh, to, to keep this close communication throughout the value chain. I think this is key to, to improve on an environmental performance. Yeah, I'd like to add in something as well that uh, Matt Ola already mentioned about the, uh, uh, the, the downstream of the value chain. And DSM also started the uh, scope three year project uh, two years ago to engage also the stakeholders uh, about um, um, yeah in the upstream value chain and to uh, yeah because uh, a large part of the um, couple footprint results of the products is coming from the raw materials so. It only happens when the industry are working together and provide the more um, uh, yeah, green materials, then we can uh, make more uh, um, better alternatives. And uh, the second point is also uh, we touch upon about the social impacts. And uh, in DSM, we also have the People Plus as uh, introduced by Ula already. And uh, that we, we, we notice it's very difficult to quantify the impact, but what we can do is qualify, uh, yeah, uh, quality uh, to uh, qualify the, uh, the the effects to see if this uh, uh, better than the mainstream in the value chain or uh, comparable or not good enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, in in that assessment, uh, we can capture lots of things has been uh, cannot be reflected directly in the eco part. Like for instance, like the well beings, uh, for instance, like the UV uh, product we have, uh, the property of the UV product we have can make the end consumer feel more uh, comfortable. The 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 sun sun cream uh, um, is more smooth and not this sticky uh, properties, and the people would like to apply more, and that. Uh, eventually lead to a better uh, uh, application of using those uh, uh, sunscreen uh, creams and better then in the end it's a beneficial for the end uh, consumers for the right. uh, house perspective. Thank you Jan, for that addition. Uh, Christina, do you uh, do you have any experience on that for your product? Because you did you described that uh, okay, you are now in the process of validating the LCA, but you also mentioned that consumer acceptance is for you uh, very important. Um, is there any way that you are already figuring out how to incorporate that, or have you done it already? Can you share your experiences on that? Yes, of course, there are two main things that I'd like to share regarding this topic. One is the consumer acceptance is key. So right from the beginning, given we, before starting the LCA, we did a lot of uh, interviews, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, um, questionnaires through a QR code with different fairs, different markets, different stakeholders that we were exposed to, to understand what were the things that mattered the most to them how they would like to uh, quantify or that how they would like their brands to quantify their impacts, why they, why, why they would trust a brand or not trust it. So we kind of try to incorporate all of that in our communications, but that's basically on the consumer side. There are other parts that are very difficult to quantify at first that are more related with the negative externalities that can arise from your good intentions or your uh, products or operations and these are for example not only with our products with the with the oil and gas industry also now everybody is uh, about everything is about decarbonization moving away from fossil fuels but all this industry right now is employing a lot of people what is going to happen with all those people this is a very very negative externality of the decarbonization yes. that is happening so any companies that are trying to make a change there, they should also keep in mind how are we going to help this industry or these people not to lose their jobs. Or for example, there is a very good example with the lab grown meat, right? And uh, it's related also with full. We are trying to transition to a more plant-based diet. We are not saying that our diet should be 100% plant-based, but we are trying to increase the percentage of plant-based uh, meals that we have. In, in our population. And this means that all the animal agriculture might be uh, suffering for this because they will lose demand. But how do we make all this uh, industry that is already developed part of the transition? 
how do we provide them with the right tools so instead of uh, growing a cow they can uh, use their uh, facilities to uh, kind of uh, install these small breweries that can actually grow meat in the future or can we make them put a piece of land and instead of uh, raising some sort of crops that feed the animals they grow microalgae i mean there are many things in which you could uh, involve them but this is something that you have to have in mind right from from the beginning and and have a plan for it uh, yeah. at least acknowledge yeah. it yeah there are a lot of different aspects and i think the discussion uh, is just excellent and it will be take taking us quite some time <laughs> a lot of food for thought i hope also for our participants um given the time i would like to uh, to wrap up the discussion uh, right now i think uh, we have been able to uh, to show from different perspectives all what it comes into place for quantifying uh, uh, and approaching sustainability in industrial biotech from a science-based perspective um, but if I would like to encourage the participants, if you have questions and uh, or just get in touch with the with the presenters or with uh, uh, with me, so that uh, I can connect you, so that uh, that the discussion may go on. Uh, thank you very much also for the speakers for your time and for sharing your uh, your presentations uh, here and your perspectives. I think it has been very valuable, and uh, uh, I would like to now now to. Uh, to give the floor shortly to, uh, to Agnes to give us some information regarding uh, the upcoming EFIP. Thank you very much and good afternoon to everyone also from me and I'm happy to say a few words from uh, Europa Bio and of course first a huge thank you for the very interesting perspective shared in this session by Christina, Ulla, John and uh, Yang and of course also to Maria Planet Bio and uh, DSM for hosting and sponsoring this pre EFIB uh, webinar today. So, just very briefly before closing, I will say a few words about uh, this European Forum for Industrial Biotechnology and the Bioeconomy, which is getting very much uh, closer now. In fact, we're just uh, two weeks away from the event, which will take place in Austria, in Vienna, on the 6th and 7th of October. And we are very happy to be able this year to progress to an in-person event. And of course, we will have and implement a, a thorough COVID hygiene concept for this. But to, uh, to say uh, or to show you here just a few key figures, what can be expected at EFIB, we will have plenaries and sessions focusing on different industry sectors and business areas from bioprocesses and technologies through to food, feed and uh, nutrition financing and investment, etc. And as we'll be in Vienna this year, working with our local partner, Lisa Vienna, we will also include a sustainable cities to our list of topics. But as you see here, uh, we are expecting around 300 participants from about 150 organizations. So there will be a range of opportunities for um, networking and exchange and one-to-one -one partnering running throughout the event. We will also have our exhibition back again, where we will have our startup village with emerging innovators and scientific approaches presented uh, in academic posters. And this year, it's also the 25th anniversary of Europa Bio, which you will be able also to take part in the celebrations for, uh, with a vote on the highest impact advance in industrial biotechnology that have been um, nominated by our members. That, amongst uh, many other things, uh, to look forward to, and uh, we are really much uh, looking forward to it, and we hope that we will see you there. And for further information, of course, feel free to reach out to us at any time. And uh, yeah, with that, Maria, I think we will close uh, today's session, right? And uh, we thank all of you again for uh, participating, and hope to see you in Vienna. Bye-bye.